Thank you, Dr. Cordes. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, as Dr. Cordes mentioned, I, I am a, a major in the Army. I see Dr. Uh, Colgan is here, and, and she's in her uniform, as she should be. And <laughs> I would be in mine as well, but uh, when I got up this morning, I noticed that I had all of the different parts of it, except for the black tie. So I, I considered just wearing this tie with it, but and I thought, no, probably not a good idea. Um, let's see, that's not focused very well. I presume that uh, Dr. Hebler gave you all a, a pretty good background on the uh, oil spill yesterday. Uh, the light up here doesn't seem to be working. Let me see. We have a plug. Yes, got it. Great. So my talk is going to be more focused on uh, the, the pathological findings in the sea outers after the oil spill. Um, in the months following the oil spill, 994 sea, otter, uh, sea otters are, are known to have died in the oil spill affected areas, and that includes uh, 871 otters that were found dead in the wild and 123 that died in rehabilitation centers. The actual number of sea otters that, that died is unknown, of course, but it's been estimated to be on the order of 2,500 to 4,000. Shortly after the, the spill occurred, the Exxon Company funded an effort to rehabilitate oil-contaminated sea otters. As far as pathology goes, uh, in those early days, some of the clinical veterinarians occasionally performed partial necropsies on otters that died. But uh, fairly soon after the event, uh, a veterinary pathologist from the University of Alaska, John Blake, became involved, and Mona, excuse me, Mona became involved. So the, the quality of the necropsies uh, became much better. Um, later, Exxon built several uh, rehabilitation facilities and hired staffs of veterinarians, and they, they also hired some veterinarians with some training in pathology to provide diagnostic support. In late April of 89, uh, veterinary pathologists from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service assumed responsibility for the pathology of uh, oil spill affected sea otters. And in June, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service requested assistance from uh, my department, the Department of Veterinary Patho Pathology at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. And eventually, we were asked to perform histopathologic studies on all of the sea otter tissues that had been collected by all of the different parties. And we were also asked later on, uh, about a year later, to, to return to Alaska and uh, perform necropsies on sea otter carcasses that had been collected and frozen. They were, uh, there were these large freezer vans full of oil-covered dead sea otters. The, uh, the government's motivation in undertaking these studies was primarily um, legal. They, they were basically doing this uh, because of the impending litigation with Exxon. Uh, 
but uh, scientific interest was, was also a, a part of it. In spite of the, the efforts of many dedicated people, there are some significant limitations in the studies, the pathological studies of the sea otters. The absence of a detailed necropsy protocol during the early days after the oil spill when most of the uh, otters died uh, was a, a major problem. Um, Frequently just, I think, uh, a lack of organization caused problems. Uh, uh, after the fact, we were unable to locate necropsy reports that corresponded to many of the otters that were killed. Uh, in other cases, people were using different numbering systems. The different numbering systems were kind of a nightmare to try to sort out and uh, match up a particular otter with a particular set of tissues with data on uh, its oil contamination status and uh, clinical information for the rehabilitated sea otters. So uh, much data was lost. Toxicologic specimens have to be handled very stringently and later on I'll show you what some of these oiled sea otter carcasses looked like and, and you will see that uh, avoiding contamination of, of specimens uh, was a, a major problem. Uh, things like the, the type of uh, containers that you put the specimens in are also critical. You can't use plastic containers because those, are, those contain petroleum hydrocarbons. Finally, uh, since many of these otters did die in rehabilitation centers, effects of captivity certainly may have played a role in some of the pathological findings. So I, I think that these problems basically illustrate the need for having detailed contingency plans and with detailed protocols before disasters such as this occur. The purposes of this first study were to identify and describe the histologic lesions in the oil contaminated sea otters and to the extent possible to attempt to determine the pathogenesis of these lesions. As part of the rehabilitation effort, Exxon uh, paid fishermen to go out in boats and uh, collect sea otters that were oil contaminated uh, or in danger of becoming oil contaminated or that were behaving abnormally. And as these sea otters were brought into the rehabilitation centers, they were uh, assessed for a degree of oil contamination based on these criteria, more than 60% heavily contaminated, 30 to 60% moderately contaminated, less than 30% or a light sheen on the fur, lightly contaminated, and if there was no visual evidence of oil, they were considered uncontaminated. As I've said, uh, many of the otters could not be included because of various problems, but uh, one thing we had to have was uh, a documented assessment of oil exposure. And the animals that we included in this study were 51 oil contaminated otters that died in the rehabilitation centers, six uncontaminated otters that died in rehabilitation centers, uh, five otters that were found dead in the wild with external oil present and six uh, apparently healthy sea otters that had been killed by gunshot in an area not affected by an oil spill uh, previously as part of unrelated research. So we used them as normal controls. The most prevalent lesion 
was interstitial pulmonary emphysema. And this came as uh, quite a surprise to all of us, I think. Um, the most common serious complications of ingestion of crude oil or petroleum hydrocarbons by people and animals is uh, aspiration pneumonia. Aspiration pneumonia basically occurs when large volumes of a foreign material enter the lungs through the airways. Oil-contaminated sea otters attempt to remove the oil by grooming with their mouths, so there would seem to be ample opportunity for aspiration pneumonia to develop, but uh, we did not find aspiration pneumonia in any of these otters. Um, you can see the, the figures here. 73% of the, the heavily contaminated otters had the lesion and uh, decreases with uh, degree of oil contamination and we did not see it in the uncontaminated otters. Histologically, the, the lesion just appears as expanded areas of clear space within the interlobular septa of the lungs. The adjacent alveoli were frequently um, atelectatic, compressed to various degrees. Um, the mechanism by which exposure to crude oil causes interstitial emphysema in sea otters is unknown. Um, the, the usual way that uh, air enters the interstitium of the lungs is because of rupture of alveoli, which is usually caused by powerful forced expiration uh, with a degree of uh, airway constriction. Um, some species are highly predisposed to developing this lesion. Cattle, for example, develop interstitial emphysema uh, spontaneously in a variety of situations, and part of the reason for that, at least, is anatomical. Uh, the animals with well-developed interlobular septa seem to be more predisposed, and sea otters have uh, well-developed interlobular septa in the lungs. Um, Interstitial emphysema has been reported in sea otters that have died with pneumonia. Uh, but as I said, the, these otters did not have evidence of pneumonia. Um, another possibility that has been mentioned by a number of people is that uh, inhalation of the volatile components of crude oil, such as benzene, might have damaged the alveolar septa and uh, caused this lesion. The only problem with that is that if, uh, uh, if that had occurred, one would expect to find interstitial pneumonia of some degree in, in some sea otters, and we didn't find that. Um, my personal speculation is that uh, I think that as the sea otters groomed and uh, ingested oil and their mouths and their uh, uh, pharynx became coated with oil, I think they probably did aspirate small quantities of the crude oil, but I think they, they were small enough to uh, uh, be removed by the, the normal clearance mechanisms of the lungs without developing aspiration pneumonia. I don't think they aspirated large volumes. And uh, the dyspnea associated with that could have, dyspnea and coughing, could have induced uh, the interstitial emphysema uh, given their anatomical predisposition. But as I said, that's, that's really a speculation. Gastric erosions and uh, associated hemorrhage were also quite prevalent in the uh, sea otters that, that died in the rehabilitation centers. Um, the, the reason for that apparent low figure for the heavily contaminated otters, 14%, is unclear. Um, 
histologically, these erosions appeared as discrete focal areas of coagulative necrosis that varied from being quite superficial to about mid-level in the gastric mucosa, as you see here. This brown pigment is created when blood comes in contact with gastric acids. The two most likely possibilities for the, the reason that the, the otters develop these lesions uh, are either because of a direct effect of the oil on the gastric mucosa or because of stress. At least those are the two possibilities that, that we have considered most likely. Gastric erosions caused by ingestion of irritant fluids tend to be extensive and one might expect them to also affect the esophagus. Um, sea otters have been reported to develop uh, acute ulcers and erosions both in captivity and in the wild and previously these uh, lesions have been attributed to stress. So uh, our interpretation is that these are stress-induced erosions. Now, since the, uh, the otters that died in the rehabilitation centers were subjected to stress associated with capture and captivity as well as stress associated with crude oil exposure, we can't really uh, say which stressor caused the uh, caused this lesion. Presumably it was a combination of uh, all stressors. Hepatic lipidosis was also quite common and by that term we, we basically mean accumulation of lipids within the hepatocytes of the liver. Um, it was found in 50 percent of the heavily contaminated otters and uh, decreasing frequency with uh, decreasing degree of contamination. Uh, one of six uncontaminated otters uh, also had the lesion. Histologically, this appeared as either single or multiple round, sharply circumscribed intracytoplasmic vacuoles within hepatocytes. Um, the distribution tended to be predominantly periportal, but in severe cases it was diffuse. And the, the presence of lipid was confirmed by staining with oil red O. Um, renal Lipidosis was also found. It was less frequent than hepatic lipidosis, and it was only seen in sea otters that also had hepatic lipidosis. And uh, the lesion is basically similar vacuoles within the tubular epithelium of the liver. Uh, potential causes for the hepatic and renal lipidosis include toxicity, mobilization of stored fat due to inadequate food intake and hypoxia. The hypoxia, when hypoxia causes uh, vacuolar or fatty change in uh, the liver, the distribution tends to be central lobular because uh, the central lobular area is most vulnerable to hypoxia. And as I said, the distribution in the outers was predominantly periportal. So we don't believe that hypoxia was involved. Experimental studies have demonstrated that oil contaminated sea otters, uh, they uh, increase their activity level and they increase their metabolic rate uh, basically because they're grooming uh, vigorously to, in an attempt to remove the oil. And they spend either a, a a cons well, the time that they devote to feeding is, is not 
increased, uh, and in some cases it's decreased. It stays the same, in other words, or it is decreased. So under those circumstances, uh, one would expect mobilization of, of fat stores. Sea otters do have a, a tremendous dietary requirement. They, they eat 30 to 40 percent of their body weight uh, daily. Uh, uh, a lot of that probably has to do with metabolic rate and the, the cold water that they inhabit. So we, we consider mobilization of, of body fat to be a, a good possibility for the cause of this lesion. Toxicity is certainly also a possibility. Um, a variety of animals that have been exposed to petroleum hydrocarbons have developed hepatic lipidosis, including rats, cattle, sheep, uh, mice, and a ringed seal. But the, the mechanism by which the, the exposure to petroleum induced uh, the fatty livers was uh, not determined in any of those studies. And renal lipidosis uh, has been reported in rats exposed to petroleum hydrocarbons. But again, the mechanism was not determined. Central lobular hepatic necrosis was also fairly common. 25% uh, of heavily contaminated, 25% of moderately contaminated, 21% of lightly contaminated. And histologically, uh, this lesion appeared as essentially coagulative necrosis of central lobular hepatocytes. You can see that this is a central vein, and the surrounding hepatocytes have lost their nuclei, and they have brightly eosinophilic cytoplasm. Cell outline is maintained, so the lesion is uh, compatible with coagulative necrosis. Potential causes of this lesion include toxins and uh, basically anything that might cause ischemia, including such things as anemia, heart failure, and shock. There were no other lesions or, or reason to suspect heart failure. Uh, shock, on the other hand, was an extremely common clinical syndrome in the otters that died in the rehabilitation centers. Anemia was also common. Crude oil ingestion in and of itself has been demonstrated to cause anemia uh, experimentally in birds. Um, so uh, a hemolytic effect is of the crude oil is possible. The gastric erosions and hemorrhage are also another possible cause of the anemia. But generally speaking, there, there was a poor correlation between the presence of the erosions and uh, anemia. So it does not seem that that, that was the, the primary mechanism. Um, so our basic conclusion is that uh, we think it's likely that, that shock and, in some cases, anemia uh, contributed to the development of this lesion and toxicity is also considered possible. Um, again, in experimental studies in birds uh, that were given crude oil orally, uh, central ovular hepatic necrosis was found, but the, the mechanism was not determined. The, uh, the five sea otters that were examined in this study that were found dead in the wild with external oil present had these lesions. One had emphysema and hepatic and renal lipidosis. Two had hepatic and renal lipidosis. And two had no distinctive lesions. The, uh, the presence of interstitial emphysema and hepatic and renal lipidosis in these non-captive oil-contaminated sea otters uh, 
and the absence of these lesions in the normal controls suggests that uh, exposure to oil was the cause rather than captivity. So in summary, these, these are the, the lesions that, uh, that seem to be associated with crude oil exposure in sea otters. I'll uh, uh, discuss a little bit more on uh, uh, pathogenesis at the end of, of this segment. A as I mentioned before, we uh, returned to Alaska in 1990 in the summer and performed a, a number of necropsies on uh, these sea otter carcasses that had been collected, placed in plastic bags, and frozen. Uh, this is what they frequently looked like. Uh, I think that's the head up there. But uh, we, we did, as I mentioned, collect samples for toxicologic analysis, and you, I think you can appreciate the, the difficulty and the care and the changing of gloves, <laughs> that uh, frequent changing of gloves that you have to do to collect those specimens and in a field situation uh, in the early days after the oil spill, it would have been even more difficult. We were in a pretty good facility. We examined 214 carcasses and of these, 152 had external oil that we could detect and 62 had no external oil that we could detect. Again, interstitial pulmonary emphysema was the most prevalent gross lesion being found in 100 of 152 or 66%. Gastric erosion and hemorrhage was found in 55% and 42% of the sea otters had both of these lesions. Uh, we could not uh, make a, a conclusive assessment of uh, the presence or absence of the, the other lesions that we found in the, the otters we examined histologically, such as uh, hepatic and renal lipidosis and central lobular hepatic necrosis. Is the focus all right on that? Uh, these are lungs from an affected sea otter, and you can see that the, uh, the inner lobular septa are markedly expanded. I, I think you can probably uh, see that the, the lungs are really bulging in uh, these zones. Um, the trapped air has also dissected into the, the mediastinum. It was fairly common for the otters to have uh, uh, both uh, mediastinal and subcutaneous emphysema around the neck and back. Lungs are also quite congested. This is uh, stomach from an affected otter, esophagus here and duodenum here. The, uh, dark material is blood, it's, it's not oil. Um, I don't think you can see the erosions uh, very well in, in this photograph, but the, they tended to be most prevalent in the pyloric area, but in severe cases, all areas of the gastric mucosa uh, had these uh, uh, multifocal or multiple discrete uh, erosions. Uh, they ranged from just a few up to about 50 and generally the, the amount of hemorrhage that was found in the gut seemed to, to correlate with the, the number of erosions that were present. 
in the uncontaminated carcasses, 13 of 62 had interstitial pulmonary emphysema. Uh, four of 62 had gastric erosion and hemorrhage, and those four, all, uh, the four actually had both emphysema and uh, gastric erosions. So the, uh, the incidence of emphysema was threefold greater in the oil contaminated than in the uncontaminated carcasses, uh, confirming the association with oil exposure. Uh, one might wonder why the uncontaminated uh, otters had emphysema at all. Um, there are a variety of, uh, of possible explanations. Um, they may have uh, uh, been lightly oil contaminated and successfully removed the oil. They may have not come in contact with the liquid crude oil but breathed the volatile components. Or they may have uh, developed the, the emphysema because of an unrelated and unrecognized uh, mechanism. One other thing I wanted to mention uh, was that the, the high incidence of gastric erosion and hemorrhage in the oil contaminated carcasses was uh, an interesting finding to us. It, it was present in 55 percent, I believe, um, because, as I mentioned earlier, the gastric erosion was also a common lesion in the rehabilitated otters, but it was unclear what the, the uh, source of stress was on, in those animals, but this study confirms that uh, gastric erosion and hemorrhage unassociated with captivity uh, occurs in oil contaminated sea otters. So, okay, another thing that the, the lawyers wanted us to do was uh, uh, make an assessment to the extent possible of cause of death in the otters. So the criteria that we used were these. Uh, if, if a carcass was oil contaminated, had one or both of the lesions associated with crude oil exposure, namely interstitial emphysema or and or gastric erosion and hemorrhage, and had no other lesions supporting another possible cause of death, we interpreted those findings as providing strong evidence of death caused by oil exposure. And uh, 123 of 214, or 57% of the otters, fit that criteria, or those criteria. In otters that were contaminated, had no lesions associated with oil exposure and no other lesions uh, supporting another cause of death, we considered to have evidence of death caused by oil exposure. And 14% uh, fit those criteria. In otters that were uncontaminated, had no lesions associated with oil exposure and no other lesions supportive of, an, of another cause of death, we called those undetermined, and 23% uh, fit, uh, fit those criteria. And for some reason, I don't have the slide, but uh, there's one more group that was uh, carcasses that had neither detectable external oil uh, nor evidence of another possible cause of death but they did have emphysema and or gastric erosions, and 11 of 214, or 5%, fit those criteria, and we also considered those to have an undetermined cause of death. There were uh, two otters that uh, 
two uncontaminated otters that had other lesions indicating a different cause of death. One had a gunshot wound in the thorax and the other had vegetative valvular endocarditis. Uh, both of these did have emphysema, by the way, and they were interpreted as having death uh, unrelated, primarily unrelated to oil exposure. So the combination of those two categories uh, that uh, were supportive of death caused by oil exposure accounted for 71% of the carcasses. So in, in spite of the significant limitations in these studies, these are nevertheless the, the largest and most detailed studies of uh, pathological findings in a marine mammal species exposed to an oil spill. And the findings support some long-held assumptions as well as bringing to light much new information. Because sea otters do lack a, a thick layer of subcutaneous fat, uh, similar to the blubber of pinnipeds and cetaceans, they're entirely dependent on the insulating properties of their fur for protection from the cold water they live in. So it's long been suspected that oil spills would uh, have very serious effects on sea otters because the, the oil would uh, uh, drastically interfere with the insulating properties of their fur and they would develop hypothermia and die and indeed, the oil spill did have a devastating effect on the otter population in Prince William Sound, and hypothermia was uh, a major clinical problem in sea otters that were presented to the rehabilitation centers. Death caused by hypothermia can occur without distinctive gross or histologic lesions. The combination of the clinical findings, the post-mortem, findings in previous research suggests the following scenario. Oil contaminated sea otters rapidly become hypothermic. They devote their activities to uh, an intensive grooming effort to remove the oil. Feeding is curtailed, uh, resulting in uh, depletion of energy stores. Grooming is marginally effective at best and causes ingestion of the oil. By unknown mechanisms, exposure to the oil causes interstitial pulmonary emphysema, which compromises respiration. The desperate situation that they're in causes a, a powerful stress reaction. And as that reaches a critical level, they develop gastric erosions and begin bleeding into the gut. The combination of all of these factors eventually overwhelm the sea otters. Uh, shock ensues, followed by death. Some of the otters succumb to hypothermia rapidly and uh, don't develop uh, any of these lesions that, that we've discussed. Others live long enough to develop uh, some or all of the, the morphological markers of this syndrome, which are interstitial emphysema, gastric erosion and hemorrhage, hepatic and renal lipidosis, and central ovular hepatic necrosis. Otters that are captured and taken to rehabilitation centers are subjected to additional stress, but they are given medical and supportive care. Okay, uh, that completes uh, the portion of my presentation on uh, the effects of oil on sea otters. Are there any questions or uh, comments from anyone at, at this point? Yes. Uh, how far this uh, association of the sanitary and the hepatic but uh, together 
in a good number of cases, there were separate meetings. They occurred uh, in both patterns. It was not uncommon for them to, to occur together. In fact, I think the example of central ovular necrosis that I showed had uh, some, some lipidosis. But uh, they occurred together and separately. There, there wasn't a, a strong correlation between the two. Was it not uh, just uh, spreading over? Because the one of the slides which showed the central central ovular necrosis, you just have after one layer of the necrosis started this lipidosis zone. Right. So I wonder whether these two lesions have not the same pathogenetic pattern. Started one and ended into the necrotic site. Well, we. Uh we didn't detect a strong correlation bet between the, the two lesions. As I said, the, the distribution of the lipidosis tended to be predominantly periportal with sparing of central ovular areas, although in the more severe examples, it was diffuse, uh, whereas the, the necrosis was central ovular. So I, I think that's a, an inconsistency there. <coughs> Excuse me. You mentioned you did some toxicologic studies, and I wonder what, what were the tissues, and was that GC mass spec, or what, what were you using there to, to confirm the presence of the oil in tissues? Well, I wasn't directly involved in the toxicologic studies, and I, I really, I can't comment on the, uh, the methods that were used. Uh, Mona may uh, have that information. I don't know. Mona, do you re recall? All of the samples were done uh, under the auspices of the damage assessment process, so that they were done in, in a couple of particular labs. The sea other samples that we analyzed were done at Texas a and under contract. Uh, the tissues that were analyzed were uh, primarily done for uh, some fat and uh, some fat and some kidney, um, some lung. Uh, as far as the techniques go, they were all very thoroughly worked out by the group that oversaw the, the scientific protocols, and I don't know they were called, uh, they were the peer group, the damage assessment group, the scientific experts or something like that. One thing that I'll say is that, unfortunately, there, with many of these otters where we had uh, histopathologic, we had material for histologic examination, and we had information on oil exposure. Uh, for many of those, we didn't have toxicologic samples. Uh, we did with some, and there was not a strong correlation between high levels of petroleum hydrocarbons and the development of the lesions. Uh, that's kind of a, uh, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say that because the numbers are small, uh, but that's my impression. Um, I think that uh, uh, the primary effects on the, the otters were physical, uh, being coated by the oil, uh, the, having to remove the oil, trying to stay warm. Um, I, I don't think that uh, uh, ingestion causing toxicity was the the primary problem. Mona, do you have any thing to? I, I think I agree with you. I don't think we have any questions. Yes. Is that Jim? We talked about before also that uh, the volatiles are mostly gone within the first couple of days on, these, on this oil. I, I guess I neglected to ask any of the other speakers either. Is, do you have an obvious uh, smell, uh, do you know, and the, does it smell like uh, bad chemicals right after the spill, or did, did anybody measure for benzene or anything in the air? Uh, Mona may be, uh, she may have more information on that than I do. I, there certainly was an odor 
associated with the, the fresh oil spill. And um, actually, there was uh, a significant amount of concern for the, the workers that were cleaning up uh, even you know, months after the spill, uh, not so much because of the, the, the volatiles that normally come off, but I think in the cleaning process, you, know, you stir things up and materials get volatilized. But uh, there certainly is an odor associated with it. Uh, benzene, I, I think, is the, the chemical that's of most concern in, uh, in the volatile components. Uh, there was a lot of concern right the day, the immediate days after the spill, people were up in light planes and helicopters doing flyovers and uh, there was a, a lot of nausea and dizziness and disorientation and things like that. Eventually I think there, there was some human health monitoring in there, but I think it was my understanding from the physicians that were there later on and so they were really quite upset that there wasn't nearly enough monitoring. But I did have an that everything goes away after the first few hours. And I can see line come in uh, at least a month down the road from the spill. And the uh, fumes coming out of the very bad. And they yeah, caused a reaction on, on my skin, and I broke out and got and stuff like that. And I called the EPA people in to, to see, because everybody says, oh, within 24, 48 hours, all this stuff is gone. And I don't know what it was before something. In, in uh, those recovery centers, did they ever do talk about coughing and agonal respiration and, and uh, dyspnea clinically in the sick and the old dying? Dyspnea was common as a presenting sign. Uh, coughing was not. And I, I did, I have uh, directly question some of the clinicians about that because uh, uh, coughing would, would uh, lend a little additional support to my speculation. <laughs> but uh, they say no, the, they, were, they had labored respiration, but they had emphysema. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, oops. <laughs> Yes, uh, again, I, I decided not to uh, go into that material because it's uh, even more fraught with limitations than, uh, than these studies. Uh, the, there were frequent elevations in liver enzymes. Um, uh, hypoglycemia was a common terminal syndrome. Uh, Uh, azotemia that was interpreted as pre-renal and probably associated with, with shock was common. Uh, anemia, variably. But uh, there were a lot of problems. Two different laboratories were used, which caused problems with comparability of results and uh, the the rehabilitation centers were in uh, uh, fairly remote locations, so frequently there was deterioration of samples. So it, uh, uh, there was lots of data that, that couldn't be used at all. And uh, I guess uh, the, what data is available has to be interpreted carefully. And another problem was that the, the blood work was all done to assist the clinicians, uh, not as part of a protocol. So it's spotty. You have lots of data on some otters, little data on other otters, and difficult to interpret. I was also wondering if uh, um, the fact that the social skills are to sex or reproductive status. Uh, I don't believe so. I, I don't think there was an association with that. I'd have to uh, go back and refresh my memory on, on some of the data, but um, we didn't make that association, but I can't recall the, you know, the, the numbers. Uh, 
degree we could the only way we could look at that was uh, how soon they died after they reached the rehabilitation center we still had no way of knowing when they were oil contaminated how long they'd been oil contaminated but uh, uh, there were some differences in that uh, heavily contaminated otters were more likely to, to die sooner uh, the lesions were, uh, they were more likely to have emphysema, uh, gastric erosions, and uh, hep hepatic and renal lipidosis. They were more likely to have all of the lesions that seemed to be associated uh, with the syndrome. The ones that died uh, after several weeks, uh, frequently did not have uh, as distinctive a, uh, a collection of, of lesions. Uh, it was more spotty. The, they might have a l emphysema, but it tended to be milder. Uh, they might have some gastric erosions. Um, so I, I'm not sure. Uh, some of the, I think some of the mortality in the, in the rehabilitation centers was definitely stress related. Um, sea otters are quite variable as individuals in the way they respond to captivity. Some of them seem able to uh, adapt fairly well, whereas others can't for whatever reason. But uh, unfortunately, I didn't bring the, uh, the, the clinical pathologic information, so I can't really address that. And uh, the uh, other, you had mentioned shock is a, perhaps a terminal incident. Is there any histological evidence of uh, either vascular compromise or thrombosis in any of these uh, slides that would support that as a uh, terminal event? No, there, there wasn't. Uh, it, one lesion that was uh, less frequent than, than the ones that we described uh, was focally extensive uh, areas of hepatic necrosis, coagulative necrosis that were infarct-like. Uh, but we didn't find thrombi or, or any other uh, vascular reason for the necrosis. It, so, uh, no, we, we did not find 